Afternoon folks. Hi John, Jackie, Susie. I am having no luck with technology today, kids. None. Give me two seconds, I'll be right back with you. Hi, John, nice to see you there. Right, sorry about that folks, I'm just not having any luck with my tech today at all. None. Anyway, where have we got? 77, 78. Oh, Jesus Christ. Not a good time for the tech to break. But I'm afraid it has. Ah well, just need to go on with it as it is. Alright, what have we got? 97, 99, 100. Lovely stuff. So, you all read the papers by now, so you're not reading a paper review. Um, so we'll get the coronavirus update, we'll have a run through the news in Scotland yesterday, because it's a review programme as you understand. And any, we're going to talk about a couple of other things. All right, so coronavirus update. Um, obviously, the tracker I used is not updated here, folks. So I'll give you the figures for yesterday anyway. All right, currently infected with COVID in Scotland, 4.57% of the population, or 1 in 20 still. All right, tested positive to the pandemic reached their shores, 1,476,000. 428, an increase of 9,491 people po testing positive for Wednesday to Thursday. In hospital, there is 1,272 COVID patients, that's up 46. It's rising again, folks, of which 16 are in the intensive care units. All right. Vaccinated 4,137,162 people in Scotland have had the dose of the vaccine, an increase of 295 people from Wednesday to Thursday. Alright, 92.8% uh, of all eligible Scots have had a single dose of the vaccine. 4,159,556 people in Scotland have had two doses of the vaccine, an increase of 738 people from Wednesday to Thursday. 87% of all eligible Scots have had two doses of the vaccine. Booster Jags, 3,440,493 people in Scotland have had three doses of the vaccine. An increase of 3,095 people from Wednesday to Thursday. 71.9% of all eligible Scots have had three doses of vaccines. Deaths. I'm sorry to report that. 36 deaths were recorded from Wednesday to Thursday. Taking the daily total to 10,824. Community and hospital deaths combined stand at 13,315. And as you know, we get a weekly update on that number. Right, a... Eh? Sorry about that. Right, moving on. Um, moving on to review some of the news for Thursday, the 3rd of March. All right. Thursday started with one headline story in the rags, the conflict in Ukraine. Mad Vlad is a targeting civ uh, civilians. Now, I'm not sure I'm not sure why anybody should be surprised by this. It's quite a, a it's quite a common um, tactic, believe it or not, especially in a place as big as the Ukraine, where the Ukrainian armies can be quite um, mobile and move about in a big area. So the idea is you target the civilians because the primary duty of government is to protect its people. You've all heard me saying that. So what happens is you start slaughtering the people and the government put their horns up and surrender. And then you have 
Then you move to the tactics that were used in France during the Second World War. The French government knew they were, the people were dying in their droves, so the French government sur surrendered and then went into insurrection. And basically, um, they attacked the new regime from within. And that's exactly what will happen in the Ukraine. But at this point in time, anybody surprised that Vlad's hitting population centres and trying to take our vital infrastructure doesn't really know what's going on. As I say, there's 44 million people in Ukraine and it's a very large landmass. The Ukrainian military are quite mobile, so they're moving about quite a bit. Makes it hard for Vlad, Vlad to take out the Ukrainian mo uh, military. So Vlad's hitting the civilian population in the hope that he can um, force Zelensky and the government to surrender. Which might be the next logical or would be the next logical step to protect the population. And then of course you send your military underground and you make it impossible for the new regime to govern. So Vlad attacking vital infrastructure and targeting civilian population isn't a surprise. Um, a, the outrage at it, I don't know why, because let's face it, that's the way wars have always been played. Just the way it is. Death tolls are always high and it's always mere civilians lose their life and more than what military personnel do. Always that way. Okay, moving on. Thursday started here in Scotland with the news that a, the child cancer a unit at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow to reopen. All right. Now the unit shut in t uh, September 2018 amid fears of waterborne infections. All right. The unit reopened a uh, reopens on the 9th of March after an 8.9 million upgrade, and uh, that'll explain why Sarwar was given time on the BBC yesterday to talk about hospital waterborne infections and Millie's law that he wants to introduce. But we've already spoken about hospital waterborne infections. There's always hospital born infections of one type or another. In Scotland, actually, hospital born infections are very, very low. But when we spoke about that, they were high when the, 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 the SNP government came to power. And as the Health Secretary Nicola Sturgeon made it her job to eradicate hospital or uh, reduce hospital born infections, MRSA and MSA were running a savvy. Um, and Scottish hospitals, they just won the Queen. The NHS had stopped in the Queen's services themselves. It had all been privatised under Labour and Lib Dem. So they were outsourced and hospital born infections went through the roof. So Miss Sturgeon, when she became Health Minister, she put the scientists to find a, uh, um, a detergent that would kill a MRSA especially. And the sets cleaning standards for hospitals and for the private companies working as cleaning companies in hospitals and that helped to reduce hospital born infections but there's always been hospital born infections um, born, born infections all right so Sarwa was given a chance to get on the on the tranny and the rattle his gums about a Millie's law where he wants to give parents a bigger say um a, and the inquiries and things like that into these things no. Moving on Thursday. Some good news. Aberdeen's a shipping company, North Star, wins £100 million worth of contracts to continue servicing oil and gas installations in the North Sea. North Star's chief executive, Matthew Gordon, says, Yeehaw! Cherching! No, what he actually said was, it's good for the company, it's good for the company's 1,400 employees, and it'll see North Star continue to provide safe services out there on the North Sea. But hey, if it was me and I'd just signed a hundred million quid's worth of contracts, I'd have been here. Yeah. <laughs> Big bonus coming this year. Right, moving on Thursday. Um, Oh aye aye. Moving on Thursday, it comes to light that the um, the Scottish offenders a uh, ranking system. This the what happens is a uh, when an offence is committed and you go before the courts, right? Your danger level to the public is assessed. It's got a ranking system, a score system. 
Anyway, this, the the IT system that's supposed to upgrade the system uh, or your rating, your rating is a dangerous criminal for each offence that you uh, consecutively commit was faulty. So when the information was being put in, when sentencing was passed in through the courts, the ranking system which ranks how dangerous you are to the public, which is important to sentencing and release dates, um, wasn't it updating. So Cuckoos in the Nest went after Trump. Blue Cuckoo in the Nest, the Tories who fancy themselves as the party of law and order. That man cracks me right up, by the way. The Tories are party of law and order. Tories are the party of breaking law and disorder. But anyway, Dross says that hey, this caused this could have put the public at danger. Anyway, hey, Justice Secretary Keith Brown says that the 150 different bodies that use the system and update the system have found no um, risk to the public so far. Emphasis on so far. So, um, it would appear that an IT glitch is a messed around with the scoring system which ranks how dangerous criminals are and they, as been pointed out, there's every chance that serious offences haven't been updated on that a list. Therefore, offenders may have got shorter sentences or been released earlier than what they should have. Okay, anyway, the problem's been fixed now. Moving on, Thursday. Thursday afternoon rolls round and First Minister's questions is on. First up was Dross. He went to the Scottish Government's 10-year um, economic plan, and Dross says it's crap. The First Minister just rolled her bloody eyes at him. She really is. She's finished with his infantile push. So the First Minister goes on to um, talk about... Um, how well the economy is done under the SNP. Only part of the UK we are balanced a trade surplus. Um, higher employment rating um, a, than, than there was when they came to power. Higher youth employment than any other part of the UK. What else we got? Um, a Scotland having the second, uh, being the, big, the second biggest region of the UK for inward investment. So it's just, she just can't be bothered with them. You can see her, and she's standing there at the lectern. You know, she just cannot be buggered with him. You know, so, anyway, Dross gets his ass kicked to her, he, um, the economic performance of the Scottish government gets sent to the naughty step. Next up, Sarwar, and we all know what Sarwar's doing. He's ambulance chasing. Sarwar talks about waiting lists within the NHS and planned staffing and recruitment. Says there's no um, human resources plan there for forward planning for staffing. So the First Minister just shakes her head at him and all. She's had it. I mean, she really is bored witless with these two. Anyway, she goes on to talk about how there's record numbers of staff in the NHS, how they're planning to um, employ mere staff, 1,500 mere, this year, um, if they can get their horns on them, because getting the grip of medical staff right around the planet's a problem. People just don't fancy it. Being a doctor's bloody hard work. Anyway, so the First Minister tells a, a Sarwa that there is planning in place. Sarwa then goes on to say that they, um, they looked at the COVID recovery plan and did their modelling on the COVID recovery plan and it wouldn't make the waiting lists any better, it would make them worse. So the First Minister rolls her eyes at him and says, I'd like to see what you're modelling. But does your model include the fact that we're actually streamlining the NHS, taking public, taking NHS services into local communities so that people get treatment faster and don't end up in hospital or have a need for um, elective surgeries and things like that because we can find their problems earlier and sort them out earlier. Dross says Sarwar had nothing. You know, she also points out to Sarwa that in the years that she's been in that parliament, Labour haven't come forward with any constructive ideas for the NHS. So Sarwa gets his arse kicked and sent to join Dross on the naughty step. Next up was, well it certainly wasn't the blue Tories, eh, sorry, it wasn't the yellow Tories, because they're bloody well irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. So, after the First Minister he, um, takes questions for um, the Blue Tories and the Red Tories, it goes on to supplementaries. You want to see the supplementary questions? 
YouTube, First Minister's Questions, you can watch it back. Or you can go to Broadcast in Scotland and watch it back on their YouTube channel, alright? Right, next up, what did we have? So that was First Ministers. Two twats to the naughty step and the First Ministers board of the read, alright? Next up was he? Thursday, First Minister tells the Scottish Parliament that she is a, a taking advice on what actions the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government could take to sanction Russians with a, um, you know, um, Russians with, with links to Putin in Scotland. Now, these sanctions would be earned above the sanctions that are in place with a, um, a, from Westminster. So they're talking about people that own a shooting estates and things like that here in Scotland. But it was, uh, I think it was Ross Greer, the Greens that brought it up. So the idea is that there'll be any more public money getting the oligarchs that own shooting estates here in Scotland. And that, uh, if uh, they can't prove where their money comes from, then there's every chance they can use the, um, a, the powers of the police to seize um, properties and things like that under the, um, what do they call it? Right, is it a profit from Crimes Act or something like that, where they go and uh, um, seize criminals, a uh, you go and seize criminals' assets and sell it to pay off uh, what I have to um, pay off their debts to society, if you like. Okay, so the first minister tells the parliament that that's uh, what's going on. Next up. Here in Scotland was the um, the introduction of the Gender Recognition Act onto the flair of the Parliament. All right. Now, there's a lot of stushy about this Gender Recognition Act. So, women's groups are worried about um, women's safe spaces like changing rooms and toilets and things like that. The changes, the main changes in the Gender Recognition Act are that a uh, um, you'll no longer need to have a medical um, certification that you have um, our gender, a, I can't mind what they call it, but a, that you would, a, you would no longer have to live in the other gender for a couple of years, you wouldn't need a doctor to certify that you're um, gender, what does it call it? Oh, I can't mind, but you're the rang, you're, you're, you're in the rang body, alright, that'll be cut for two years to six months, alright, after three months, you make a declaration, a legal declaration to say that you intend to live as a female for the rest of your life, whether you're going to be pre-op or, or have the op or whatever. And uh, and there will be ramifications if you don't live for that for the rest of your life. If you're flicking back and forth between the two genders, then you'll have breached that uh, um, declaration you made and it is a criminal offence. So you can face up to two years in jail for it. Alright, so... The women's groups are claiming it's going to um, breach women's rights. The Scottish government says it protects women's rights. And will this bill pass? Yep, this bill will pass. No matter what you think about it. As Davies already hung as a Jake on the on the coat on the on the on the hook in this one, I have no understanding of it. I have transgender friends, I have gay friends, I've, you know, but as far as I'm concerned, eh, I, it's beyond my ken. I don't understand the mechanisms of a eh, officially changing gender and things like that. But this bill will definitely pass. Um, it will pass because it's got support of the SNP, it's got support of the Greens, it's got support of Labour, and it's got support of eh, the Yellow Tories, the Lib Dem. So one way or another it will pass. What's interesting about this particular bill is it's a it's not a free vote. I think that's right. People should be allowed to vote on their conscience in this one. So, the SNP are whipping their MSPs to vote for it. The Greens are probably whipping their MSPs to vote for it. But I think it's right. It should be a free vote. It would appear everybody's got an opinion on this stuff. Alright. Now, so that was basically Scottish news yesterday. What was going on down that road in the House of Thieves and Carpetbaggers? Well, apparently the idiot that used to be the education secretary down there is a Grant Sharp. I think he's been promoted to the House of Lords anyway. He's in the House of Lords because he's got too much dirt, uh, dirt on Bojo. And, of course, Ukraine's tapping a, tapping a talk to the town down that road because it's hiding 
everything else, the cost of living crisis, the disaster that is Brexit, it's a, it's hiding. Um, the party gate saga down there. In fact, by now, Bojo should have been issued with his ticket. Because his questionnaire, and I get this folks, hey, a questionnaire. Instead of being dragged down the police station, interviewed under caution, they sent out questionnaires. That sets a precedence, doesn't it? Uh, I wonder how many court cases in the future will say, hey, this is null and void because my, my client didn't get a questionnaire. That'd be wonderfully funny, wouldn't it? So, doing that road, the talk of the steamy is still um, Ukraine and uh, the situation in Ukraine. Okay. So, we're not going to get much sense out of the house of thieves and carpetbaggers while everybody's applauding each other for being such good anti-Russian citizens. You know, Russia bad, everything bad. You see, now up here we've got the First Minister saying to people, hey, hey, divest yourself of Russian interests. Down the road you've got people saying divest yourself of Russian interests, but the UK government isn't divesting itself of Russian interests. 2.9 million quid's worth of contributions. The Tory party's not getting them back. Oligarchs want to get their money out the UK two weeks before the sanctions come in. The UK's then piss all except for tub thumping and trying to make it look good. And I believe the evil one is in Poland today on the border. And according to hey, used comedians, she's out there trying to get some fruit pickers. <laughs> Ah, absolutely mental. Right, let's go into some of the other subjects I want to talk about, which are no mainstream news at the moment. I want to talk about the propaganda war that's going on, all right? RT was taken off the air, and it would appear that Russia's playing tit for tat and tend on the BBC World Service in Russia as well. Um, control of social media is quite important as well. Um, here in the West, what's happening is governments are spending huge amounts of money to make sure that they are propaganda hits through our social media before anybody else's. And in a Russia, Putin's not subtle, he's just shut the whole fucking lot down. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but propaganda is going to be important to us, folks. And it, it'd be a good idea if you own your search engine and have a look at how the different methods of spreading propaganda. Carpet bombing, astroturfing, um, social media ads, um, misdirection and misinformation in the mainstream media. It's going to be important that we all learn how to spot this because there is a referendum coming up. Nothing's going to stop it. Absolutely nothing. Gordon Ross did his wee show on it yesterday on his reply for um, Mike Russell. Now, Mike Russell doesn't say anything different from what I've been saying to you guys for the last couple of years. We don't need a Section 30 order. It's not England's business, what Scotland does. Elections are devolved. A referendum's just a bloody election. But more importantly, who's got the right to stop a people from asking questions? And Bojo and his cabal have just backed himself into a corner, talking about the, sub uh, <laughs> the sovereign rights of nations to make their own decisions. In this case, they were talking about Ukraine, of course. But Scotland's a recognised nation and the people here are sovereign. So, referenda bill will be presented and the referendum will go ahead. Will we win it? Well, that depends on the propaganda war. There's a couple of things in the timeline that Gordon uh, spoke about yesterday on how this would work itself out after the referendum actually takes place. Um, somewhere, th a third or fourth in this list was international recognition. International recognition will happen immediately. That will happen even before any negotiations take place. The minute there's a yes vote, and the queer will of the Scottish people has been expressed in a legal and fair um, plebiscite, or in this case a referendum, then the international community will recognise Scotland under international law, as long as the referendum is held under um, fair conditions. Then 
the international community will want to will, will recognise Scotland right away, even before anything else happens. Gordon has it. I'm a wee bit down the line. He's talking about recalling MPs and repealing the Scottish Acts of Union. That will happen after international recognition. The first thing that will happen will be in, in, Scotland will be internationally recognised that the will of the people has been expressed and Scotland has decided to become independent. The first people to flee through the door to say hi Scotland will be probably Norway and the Nordic countries followed by the EU. After that, Gordon's right, there will be a domino effect as everybody accepts the situation except for Westminster and they can stamp their feet and make all the noise they want. Doesn't matter. Once it's once the once the election's over, the declaration's been made, right? The international community will recognise us, our MPs will leave Westminster, they will come up the road, there will be a constitutional convention, there will be a vote, the vote will be carried, and the, the Scottish side of the Acts of Union will be repealed. He's right about that. But that'll come after international recognition. Um, international recognition will happen. The minute the results are announced. Countries will start to put their heat above the parapet and say welcome back to the planet Scotland. But make no mistake about it, folks. This referendum will go ahead. I've always been confident there'll be a referendum this time. Why I've been confident there'll be a referendum this time? Because it's been cut, kicked down the road for too long. The SNP would be a busted flush if there's no referendum. And hey, how can I be confident that the SNP would be a busted flush if there's no referendum? Because me and a certain friend of mine will fucking put our shoulder to the wheel and bust it. We will chase Miss Sturgeon over the border. Um, so Mike Russell's reply to Gordon uh, Gordon's couple of questions um, were basically what I've been telling you the whole time this referendum will go ahead it will be legal it will be legal under Scots law and uh, the UK can try and take us to the Supreme Court and the Westminster can try and take us to the UK Supreme Court and all sorts of things. It won't matter. The UK Supreme Court will rule against them. And if they try to take us to the UK Supreme Court before the referendum, to have the court say it would be illegal for us to have a referendum, then the Supreme Court's also going to say that, no, nah, that's not true. They can have a referendum if they want. Can he stop them? The Supreme Court's not going to uphold Westminster's side in this. And Westminster knows that. Westminster knows that. That's why Michael Gove has said four times that they won't challenge the referendum bill in court. Why won't they challenge the referendum bill in court? Because they can't. Will they challenge the outcome of the referendum in court? No. As to unionist boycotting it, well, I've said this many times, and Gordon said this yesterday, although I've said it repeatedly, they can boycott it if they want. They had the bloody franchise. A referendum's like any other election. We don't know and void the outcome of the council elections because only 1,000 people showed out to vote and award them maybe 20,000 people. We don't know and void the outcome of the Scottish general election because only 57% of the population turned out to vote. We don't and never have overturned the outcome of a UK general election because only 38 to 40% of the population got to vote. You've got a franchise. If you don't use a franchise, that's your choice. There's no laws saying that you have to vote. But there's also nothing saying that they're going to avoid the vote because you didn't even have your arse and go down the polling station. So... If unionists say they're going to boycott this referendum, well, that's fine. It will stand. The outcome will stand. It was their own fault for not getting involved. Getting involved. They had a franchise; they could have exercised it. Right. So it's really quite important, folks, that we understand that a. This referendum is going to go ahead. Might be a wee bit later. 
than when we're expecting at the tail end of next year. It might even go into early 2024. But that'll be a decision for the Scottish Parliament once that bill's passed. And that bill will pass. Once the bill's passed, then there'll be discussions on the date. If the COVID situation, which we've just read out, is actually deteriorating and getting worse at the moment, or even World War Three gets in the road, but there'll be a referendum before the end of this parliament, because if there isn't, the SNP is a busted flush. And we'll have to start again from, from scratch. Simple as that. From the very scratch. People might jump onto the Alpha party and hope to uh, speed things up a bit, but it won't. It took 90, 85 years for the SNP to get by the other day. If the Alpha party think they can scoose this and get into the public conscience that fast, they won't. History doesn't lie. Look at how long it took the SNP to get where they are. Look at where the Greens are the new. The Green movement's been on the go for 50, 60 years. One MP in Westminster. Ten MSPs in Holyrood. What makes the upper party think they're going to be any different? They're not. So, if there's no referendum to leave this parliament, and the SNP's a busted flush, you're looking at 50, 60 years, kids, are full this is back in the agenda. And that's why Davey's been saying, keyboard warriors, go on your keyboards and email your MPs and your MSPs and tell them they better fulfil this mandate. And make it clear to them, if they don't fulfil this mandate, then the next time there is an election, oh, as independent supporters will boycott it and they'll always their fucking jokes. There are ways to go about this and put pressure on our MPs and MSPs. Now the procedure is basically as Gordon set out with the exception that there will be international recognition almost immediately after the result is declared. As long as the referendum has been held legally, fairly, and meets up to international standards, then the outcome will be accepted internationally immediately. There won't be any if, buts, or maybes about it. There won't be any process between before the international community is ready to step up and recognise us. The international community will step up and recognise us right away. Maybe take a couple of, it maybe take six months or something to get the UN to finally stamp our membership of the United Nations. But international recognition will happen almost immediately. In fact, immediately. I say I expect Norway will be the first one through the door followed by Iceland and then the other Nordic countries and then the EU. And that will happen very quick, within hours. Within hours. As the Westminster challenging anything, you're not challenging nothing. If it's done legally under Scots law, and Scots law and English law, well, never the two will meet. And the Supreme Court can only make judgments on laws passed in Scotland um, if they're out with Scots law. Uh, if they're written incorrectly and what the experts on the Supreme Court panel, who are experts on Scots law, say it's out with Scots law. And they, having a, having a vote on anything, is no outside any law. It's no, it's called democracy. Democracy is a living, breathing thing. Alright? So, you've heard it for me, you've heard it for Gordon, you've heard it for Mike Russell. You heard it for me, then you heard it for Mike Russell, and then you heard it for Gordon. This has gone ahead. With or without Westminster permission, but I'm telling you, there will be a section there the other. Oh, well, A, because Westminster will want to save face because they'll be tell we're going to do it anyway. And B, they'll want to get involved. The reason why they want to get involved is because if they don't agree, then under international law they can't be involved. And any interference would be a breach of international law. Not that Westminster gives a shite about international law anyway, they're breaching it all the time. I mean, we have the borders, uh, um, sorry, the Nationalities and Borders Bill, breaches international law. But with Priti Patel try to abandon international law when it comes to rescuing people at sea, um, well, with the Human Rights uh, Act about to be overturned, 
we had the Covert and Human Sources Bill, which allows agents of the government to break the law. That lot did not would or no averse to breaking laws, especially this particular cr criminal cabal. But hey, you see, this referendum's going to go ahead. All right. I'm not going to bother with what the papers are going to say the day, folks, because let's face it, you've had all day to read them. So I'm going to go and see if I can sort out my tech problems. That's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this one's not as funny or as uh, ranty or as shouty as the last three days. But hey, every roll comes to an end and the weekend's rolling up. So, the usual stuff. Support the independent media, alright? Support Broadcasting Scotland, support Independence Live and the live radio support. Hey. Oh, there's a couple other things I need to talk about um, before we move on. Sorry about that. Tonight, 7 o'clock, myself and my partner on Treason will be in the end of two cafe on a live Zoom for a question and answer. Anybody wants to join us, go to the cafe, join the cafe group, 7 o'clock tonight, the Zoom will be on live. Okay. And uh, what was the other thing? March in Paisley tomorrow. Weather's going to be lovely. It's outdoors. It's relatively safe. Let's see if we can get a turnout because the last three I've attended have less than 2,000 people at them. The last one I went in Edinburgh had 600 people at it. The mainstream media will take that and portray it as no appetite for independence. So if you can get to Paisley the Mora, I think it's 11 o'clock set off of Fiji Park. If you can get to Paisley the Mora, get there. This is the point in time where we actually have to start showing that there is an appetite. Because we're going to be told repeatedly by the propaganda machine that there is no appetite. Poland says otherwise. I'm sure Westminster's internal Poland says otherwise. And Poland says otherwise. So if you can get to Paisley tomorrow, get to Paisley tomorrow. We need to start getting people back on the streets. The fact that there's so many marches isn't a great idea because it just means people have got to cherry pick what they can get to when they can afford to get to it. It makes much more sense to have four or five big marches through the year. But hey, all under one banner's fragmented, so you've got Yes 2 and you've got Sims and you've got all under one banner. So there's a multitude of marches out there and that's going to lessen the amount of people each march if people decide what ones they're going to attend and what ones they're not. But tomorrow, Paisley, if you can get there, get there. Right, back to what I was saying. Okay, when it comes to the question of independence, part is on politics in your pockets. Alright, keep your eyes on the prize. Um, sing for the one hymn sheet. Don't let the unions get the levers in the cracks. Support the independent media. Support Broadcasting Scotland, Independence Live, Indie Live Radio, Caledon Media, Two's Radio, iSquat Magazine and the National Newspaper. Support independence bloggers and bloggers. And if they've got a crowdfunder gone, you've got a few pennies to spare, throw them in the port. Alright, health message and face covering in closed public spaces. Clean hands and surfaces regularly. When it comes to social distancing, have a look around about you in the set and you're in and use your napper. Always think to yourself, because COVID's high out there, 1 in 20 people have got it. According to the latest figures, 1 in 20. So 1 in every 20 persons that you meet will have COVID. So when you are in, a public setting when it comes to social distancing. Look about you, use your napa. If I'm asymptomatic, how's it going to affect that person there, that person there, that person there? Use your savvy. All right. And tests. Keep testing until they start charging. The other, oh, and before we go, by the way, I've just heard in the news today that it's expected by the end of the year the cost of heating the average home will be £3,000. 3,000. Think about that. And when you're thinking about it, have a look at your income. But I know one thing, if I'm a pensioner right now on £8,786 a year of state pension, and I'm having to lay 3,000 out just to keep my house warm, how do I pay my rent? How do I pay my council tax? How do I fucking feed myself? This is suicide stuff. And then we're not talking about it. Just don't pay on myself. I need to do any is need to run a car. Jesus Christ. Cost of living crisis right enough. Right, listen, you will have a good weekend. Otherwise I could sit here and rabbit fish all day. <laughs>
you all have a good weekend. Join us in the cafe at 7 o'clock at night. With the, uh, join me and David in the cafe at night. The two Davids for a question and answer session. Um, should be interesting. I'll be sitting with a beer, so I might get a bit outrageous. <laughs> have a lovely weekend. Hope to see you all in Paisley tomorrow.